Meekness ranks so low on the mortal scale of things, and yet so high on God's. For none is acceptable before God save the meek and lowly in heart. The rigorous requirements of Christian discipleship cannot be met without the tutoring which is facilitated by meekness. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. Jesus the carpenter undoubtedly had personal experience making many yokes with Joseph, and thus the Savior gave us that marvelous metaphor out of his own experience. Unlike servitude to sin, by wearing his yoke we truly learn of the yoke master in what is an education for eternity as well as for mortality. Meekness is needed, therefore, in order for us to be spiritually successful, whether in matters of the intellect, in the management of power, in the dissolution of personal pride, or in coping with the challenges and the routine of life. With meekness, living, as a prophet urged, in thanksgiving daily is actually possible even in life's stern seasons. Meanwhile, the world, however, regards the meek as nice but quaint people, as those to be stepped over or stepped on. Nevertheless, the development of this virtue is a stunning thing just to contemplate, especially in a world in which so many others are headed in opposite directions. These next requirements clearly show the unarguable relevance as well as the stern substance of this sweet virtue. Serious disciples are not only urged to do good, but also to avoid growing weary of doing good. They are not only urged to speak the truth, but also to speak the truth in love. They are not only urged to endure all things, but also to endure them well. They are not only urged to be devoted to God's cause, but also to be prepared to sacrifice all things, giving, if necessary, the last full measure of devotion. They are not only to do many things of worth, but are also to focus on the weightier matters, the things of most worth. They are not only urged to forgive, but also to forgive seventy times seven. They are not only engaged in good causes, but they are to be anxiously engaged. They are not only to do right, but also to do right for the right reasons. They are told to get on the straight and narrow path, but then are told that this is only the beginning, not the end. They are not only to endure their enemies, but also to pray for them and to love them. They are urged not only to worship God, but astonishingly they are instructed to strive to become like Him. In the midst of all these things, they are given a Sabbath day for rest, during which they do the sweetest but often the hardest work of all. Who else but the truly meek would even consider such a stretching journey? The preceding enumeration is certainly a verification of the crucial role of meekness and the role it plays in the lives of serious disciples. Thus, if we would really learn of the Savior, it will be by taking the yoke of such experiences upon us. This is a high yield, but a very severe form of learning. However, there is no other way. Moreover, when so yoked, we may then get much more learning than we bargained for. Furthermore, to be spiritually successful, Jesus' yoke cannot be removed part way down life's furrow even after a good showing up to that point. We are to endure well to the end. Did Paul not speak knowingly of the fellowship of Christ's sufferings? Are we not told that meekness is so vital that God actually gives us certain challenges in order to keep us humble? Did not Peter write regarding how Christians should expect to become familiar with fiery trials? Furthermore, as the disciple enriches his relationship with the Lord, he is apt to have periodic public relations problems with certain others by being misrepresented and misunderstood. He or she will simply have to take it at times. Meekness, therefore, is a key to the deepening of our discipleship. 
In the exchange between Jesus and a righteous young man, we see how one missing quality cannot be fully compensated for, even by other qualities, however praiseworthy. The young man saith unto him, All these things I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In this instance, brothers and sisters, the missing meekness prevented a submissive response by the young man. This altered his decision and all the consequences flowing from that decision. There appears, therefore, to be no other way to learn certain things except through the relevant clinical experiences. Happily, the commandment, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, carries an accompanying and compensating promise from Jesus. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. This is a very special form of rest. It surely includes the rest resulting from the shedding of certain needless burdens, fatiguing insincerity, exhausting hypocrisy, and the strength-sapping quest for recognition, praise, and power. Those of us who fall short in one way or another often do so because we carry such unnecessary and heavy baggage. Being overloaded, we sometimes stumble, and then we feel sorry for ourselves. But we need not carry such baggage. However, when we are unmeek, we resist the informing voice of conscience. We resist feedback from family, leaders, and friends. Whether from preoccupation or pride, the warning signals go unnoticed or unheeded. However, if sufficient meekness is in us, it will not only help us to jettison unneeded luggage, but will also keep us from becoming mired in the ooze of self-pity. Furthermore, true meekness has a metabolism which actually requires very little praise or recognition, of which there is usually such a shortage anyway. Most of the time, the sponge of selfishness quickly soaks up everything in sight, including praise intended for others. Disciples are to make for themselves a new heart by undergoing a mighty change of heart. Yet we cannot make such a new heart while nursing old grievances. And the meek understand this. Just as civil wars lend themselves to the passionate preservation of ancient grievances, so civil wars within the individual soul, between the natural and the potential man, keep alive old slights and perceived injustices, except in the meek. Is there not deep humility in the omnicompetent Christ, the majestic miracle worker who acknowledged, I can of mine own self do nothing? Jesus neither misused nor doubted his power, but he was never confused about its source. Instead, we mortals, perhaps even when otherwise modest, are sometimes quite willing to display our accumulated accomplishments as if we had done it all by ourselves. Hence this sobering reminder. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. Meekness is especially needed to labor in the Lord's vineyard, which involves such lowly work, lowly as the world measures worth. No wonder, as one prophet wrote, the laborers in the Lord's vineyard are comparatively few. Moreover, the Lord's work is not usually performed on a luxuriant landscape, but, said Jacob, in the poorest spot in all the land of the vineyard. The world's Caesars pay little heed to such itinerant workers. Had Jesus not been meek and lowly when a great multitude with swords and staves came to take him, he could have resisted his destiny. Led by Judas, 
there came thither that band of men with lanterns and torches. So spiritually blind was that multitude, they actually needed lanterns to see and capture the light of the world. Though he was actually the creator of this world, the earth being his footstool, Jesus' willingness to become from birth a person of no reputation provides one of the great lessons in human history. He, the leader servant, who remained of no reputation mortally, will one day be he before whom every knee will bow and whose name every tongue will confess. Jesus meekly stayed his unparalleled course. Brigham Young, who stayed his lesser but very impressive course, knew both the fatigue of leadership and the special rest which Jesus promised. Brigham counseled those less spiritually secure in the Church and more anxious about the outcome. It is the Lord's work. I know enough to let the kingdom alone and do my duty. It carries me. I do not carry the kingdom. I sail in the old ship Zion, and it bears me safely above the raging elements. In our own time, the late Elder Legrand Richards was heard by some of us to declare several times that he did not fret about the Church because it's the Lord Church, so I let him worry about it, said Legrand. Wise secular leaders are not strangers to meekness either. This next episode from the life of George Washington involved a mutinous situation among some of the officers of his army. Washington called together the grumbling officers on March 15, 1783. He began to speak carefully and from a written manuscript, referring to the proposal of either deserting our country in the extremest hour of her distress or turning our arms against it. Washington appealed simply and honestly for reason, restraint, patience, and duty, all the good and unexciting virtues. And then Washington stumbled as he read. He squinted, paused, and out of his pocket he drew some new spectacles. Gentlemen, you must pardon me, he said in apology. I have grown gray in your service and now find myself growing blind. Most of his men had never seen the general wear glasses. Yes, the men said to themselves, eight hard years. They recalled the ruddy, full-blooded full planter of 1775. Now they saw a big, good, fatherly man grown old. They wept, many of those warriors, and the Newburgh plot was dissolved by a meek man. The meek leader having humbleness of mind is not only more easily taught, but he is also freer. Even in routine, he is relieved, for instance, of the pressure that other leaders feel to be the single or even the chief source of ideas for the group, nor need he be the sole source of his group's memory. He lets others, too, report what they see by the light of what Samuel Coleridge called experience and history's lantern on the stern. The meek individual, however, is more concerned with the light on the bow, which shines ahead. He need not be afraid to praise, lest someone gain on him. He follows the pattern of rejoicing in the achievements of others, as shown so effulgently by the Father and the Son. After all, the meek and lowly leader Jesus did not need advanced men with paid demonstrators and bands and banners. Behold, thy King cometh unto thee, meek, sitting upon a colt. Meekness of mind is not only essential salvationally, of course, it is also vital if one is to experience true intellectual growth, especially that which heightens his understanding of the great realities of the universe. Such meekness is a friend, not a foe, of true education. Stephen spoke of Moses just before Stephen's martyrdom and said, <clears throat> Moses was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptian and all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. 
Though Moses was a learned man, he was, the scriptures tell us, the most meek man upon the face of the earth. So it was that he could and did learn things which he never had supposed. As the well-educated Paul warned, the indiscriminate approach to learning fails to distinguish between chaff and kernels. Therefore, some are proudly ever learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Unsurprisingly, therefore, great stress is deservedly placed upon the need for intellectual meekness, humbleness of mind. Meekness is thus so much more than a passive attribute, which merely deflects discourtesy. Instead, it involves spiritual and intellectual activism. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel. Meek Nephi, in fact, decried the passivity of those who will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness. Alas, most of us are unsearching, quite content with a superficial understanding or a general awareness of spiritual things. This condition may reflect either laziness or, as in Amulek's case, the busyness which is usually incident to the pressing cares of the world. Intellectual meekness, therefore, is a persistent and a particular challenge. Without it, we are not intellectually open to things which we never had supposed. Alas, there are some who have otherwise reached provincial and erroneous conclusions and do not really want to restructure their understanding of things. Some wish neither to be shaken nor expanded by new data. Just as meekness is in all of our virtues, so is pride in all of our sins. Whatever its momentary and alluring guise, pride, as Henry fairly articulately notes, is the enemy. It is the first of all the sins. The meek individual may not, to be sure, always be able to fully decipher what is happening to him or around him. However, even though he does not know the meaning of all things, he knows that the Lord loves him. He may feel overwhelmed, but unlike the proud, he is not out of control. In fact, brothers and sisters, in some moments, it is important for us, as the scriptures urge, be still and know that I am God. Articulate discipleship has its side of silent certitude. The rest, the peace promised by Jesus to the meek, though not including an absence of adversity or tutoring, does therefore give us a special peace which flows from humbleness of mind. The meek management of power and responsibility relieves us of the heavy and grinding chains of pride. However glitzed and polished, they are still chains. Meekness also protects us from the fatigue of being easily offended. There are so many among us just waiting to be offended. They are so alerted to this possibility that they will not be treated fairly. They almost invite a verification of their expectation. The meek, not on such an alert, find rest to their souls from this form of fatigue. Bruising as the tumble off the peak of pride is, it may be necessary at times. Few of us escape at least some of those bruises. Even then, one must next be careful not to continue his descent into the swamp of self-pity. Meekness instead enables us, after such a tumble, to pick ourselves up, but without putting others down blamefully. Meekness mercifully lets us retain realistic and rightful impressions of how blessed we are so far as the fundamental things of eternity are concerned. We are not then as easily offended either by the disappointments of the day. And the disappointments of the day seem to come in a sufficient and steady supply to all of us. When we are thus spiritually settled, we will likewise be less apt to murmur and to complain. Indeed, one of the great risks of murmuring is that we can get too good at it too clever. We can even acquire too large an audience. 
Furthermore, for what may be for the murmurer a mere transitory grumble may become a cause for someone else, a cause that may carry him or her clear out of the Church. The meek are unconcerned with prideful preeminence, including considerations of scale. The lowly are not exercised, for instance, over quantitative considerations. The Lord put that concern to rest centuries ago when he said, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep that oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. When the Lord declared, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, it was therefore not only an indication of how profound recognition and familiarity would be at work, it also bespoke another role of operational meekness. Listening long enough and humbly enough for such recognition to occur. This readiness with ears to hear has been needed in all dispensations, but never more than after the Restoration. The restitution of all things ended centuries of deprivation, but the Restoration goes so sharply against the grain of heedless secular societies. So while the truths of the Restoration are had again, they are useful among only as many as shall believe. Yet even among those astray, the meek understand the scriptures that says, Those astray include the humble followers of Christ, who err only because they are taught by the precepts of men. Additionally, the adversary's kingdom must shake, in order that those who will may be stirred up unto repentance. The meek understand such realities and will be humble in the events in the world that bring them to pass. Meekness also contains a readiness which helps us to surmount the accumulated stumbling blocks and the rocks of offense. We can make stepping stones of them by means of which we can achieve a deeper and a broader view of life. Obviously, Philip had such a readiness and meekness when he recognized Jesus as the Messiah of whom Moses had spoken. Obviously, Paul had the broad view, too, when he described Jesus, Moses as having foregone the favored life in Pharaoh's court for a life of service to Jesus. Nevertheless, brothers and sisters, the stumbling stones and the rocks of offense are real, and they are all about us. In fact, these offending rocks can prove insurmountable unless we have the facilitating attribute of meekness. It promises us access to the helping grace of God. Even if it stood alone as a benefit, one reason for developing greater meekness is to have greater access to the grace of God. The Lord, in fact, guarantees that His grace is sufficient for the meek. Besides. Only the meek know how to draw fully upon his assistance anyway. Meekness comes trailing a cloud of other beneficial considerations. The prophet Mormon observed that without meekness there can be no faith, nor hope, nor love. Furthermore, the remission of our sins brings additional meekness along with the great gift of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. These supernal blessings are not to be enjoyed for very long or any length of time except by those who are genuinely meek. As to genuine joy, it is, the scriptures say, to be received by none save it be the truly penitent and humble seeker of happiness. Preliminarily, therefore, we cannot even have true faith except we are meek and lowly in heart. Thus, we are able to enjoy greater faith, hope, love, knowledge, and reassurance. We will know the answer to what Amalek called the great question whether there really is a rescuing and redeeming Christ. It is by the power of the Holy Ghost that the meek know that Jesus is the Christ, that he lived and that he lives. Thus it is the meek who receive the great answers to the great questions and who rejoice, therefore, over the great and last sacrifice. Since life in the Church illustrates, and painfully at times, our own defects and the defects of others as well. 
periodically you and I are bound to be disappointed in ourselves and in others. <clears throat> we cannot expect it to be otherwise in a kingdom where initially not only does the gospel net gather of every kind, but those of every kind are also at every stage of spiritual development. When people leave their nets straightway, they come as they are. And though in the initial process of changing, their luggage reflects their past. Hence, discipleship today is a developmental journey which requires of us shared patience, shared understanding, and shared meekness on the part of all who join that caravan. Together, we are disengaging from one world and preparing ourselves for another and far better world. Meekness and patience seem to have a special mutuality. If there were too much swiftness, there could be no long suffering, no gradual soul stretching, no repenting, with too little time to absorb, to assimilate, and to apply the truths already given, our capacities would not be fully developed. Pearls cast before us would go unfound, ungathered, and unsavored. It takes time to prepare for eternity, and the meek understand this. For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. Thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. For unto him that receiveth I will give more. The meek are also less likely to ask amiss in their prayers. Being less demanding of life to begin with, they are less likely to ask selfishly or to act selfishly. In so many ways, the wise interplay of our individual agency with God's loving purposes for us is greatly facilitated by our meekness. Were it not so, we would at best offer ourselves pridefully to God, but only as we now are, take it or leave it, which is an unacceptable offering. The only individual who might have credibly done that instead meekly submitted himself to the Father's further shaping will. Meekness could have rescued proud and fearful Judas even after he left the Last Supper. He could have slipped back in quietly later, rejoining his apostolic colleagues, having belatedly determined not to do the dastardly deed he did. Meekness can rescue us all from ourselves even when we are deep in error and even when others have written us off. Meekness enlarges the soul, but without hypocrisy. Contrarywise, what the scriptures speak of as littleness of soul ensures that only a small view of reality will be taken. This narrow view prevailed, for instance, when Cain slew Abel and then gloried and boasted, Behold, now I am free. Free? Yes, free to be a fugitive and a vagabond in the stretching desert he had made of his own life. Both Cain's desire for Abel's flocks and his being offended at the acceptance of Abel's sacrifice played a part in his fall. Moreover, proud Cain rejected the greater counsel which was had from God. The small myopic view also lends itself in the Lord's words to coveting the drop while neglecting the more weighty matters. In all of our getting and grasping, we do not seem to grasp, brothers and sisters, the implications of this searching question for, from the Lord. For have I not made the fowls of heaven and also the fish of the sea and the beasts of the mountains? Have I not made the earth? Do I not hold the destinies of all the armies of the nations of the earth? <clears throat> No wonder the Lord also reminds us acquisitive mortals, for what is property unto me? I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine. One day, brothers and sisters, he will share all he has with the meek. For everyone else, whatever their temporary possessions, the Creator's reversion clause will take effect. 
The meek likewise understand still another reality that as much as more or more than anything else, it is our faith and our patience which are to be tried. Our trials, however, occur in the context of this precious promise. Thus God has provided a means that man through faith might become a great benefit to his fellow beings. Before he became encrusted with power, Saul knew a time when he was little in his own sight. However, meekness did not stay on as his uninvited guest. It quickly departs where not wanted. It is so easy for us to become puffed up and to be condescending to others. One devoted public servant who ably served several British prime ministers as their private secretary wrote, Vanity is a failing common to prime ministers. I suppose it is natural in view of the adulation they receive, but to which they are not, like kings, accustomed. Fortunately, we have fine examples to help us with regard to meekness, and I need go no further than my own quorum. The acting president of the Council of the Twelve, President Howard W. Hunter, is a meek man. He once refused a job he needed as a young man because it would have meant that another individual would have lost his job. This is the same lowly man when I awakened after a weary and dusty day together with him on assignment in Egypt, who was quietly shining my shoes, a task he had hoped to complete unseen. Meekness can be present in the daily and ordinary things. The president of the Council of the Twelve, President Marion G. Romney, is also a meek man. The scene was a fast and testimony meeting in his home war just after his being first sustained by the Church as a counselor in the First Presidency. Touchingly, tenderly, and meekly, President Romney said to his beloved neighbors that he could obediently sustain whomever the Lord called even when the person called was Mary and G. Romney. All of us who were there loved him the more. Meekness can be there even in moments of deserved recognition. Sir Thomas More was a victim of injustice and irony. Generously and meekly, just as he was about to be martyred, he said. Paul was present and consented to the death of St. Stephen and kept their clothes that stoned him to death. And yet be they, Stephen and Paul, now both twain holy saints in heaven, and shall continue their friends forever. So I verily trust and pray that though your lordships now here in earth have been judges to my condemnation, we may yet hereafter in heaven merrily all meet together to our everlasting salvation. Meekness can be present in moments of injustice and crisis at the hands of lesser men. Jesus meekly endured the lesser spiritual maturity in the Twelve and in his other disciples. He endured this while helping to remedy it. He did this without condescension, without despairing, without cynicism, and without murmuring. We have only to look at his prayers to the Father for and in behalf of his disciples to see how perfect his love is. Indeed, when his followers deserved censure, they received teaching. And though he sometimes spoke reproving truth to them, Christ spoke the truth in love. What a contrast to us mortals. At times, we withhold self, reproof, time, talent, and knowledge from others in order to retain a seeming advantage, an edge. No wonder there could never be compliance with consecration without meekness for consecration seeks to share, not to withhold. The full witness does not come until after the trial of your faith. We are told those trials may be very focused. President Lorenzo Snow once said to the Twelve of his day, every one of us who has not already had the experience must yet meet it of being tested in every place where we are weak. Indeed, brothers and sisters, did not the Lord specifically promise the meek that he would make weak things become strong unto them. In all of those instances available on record, the Lord has displayed much gentleness and tenderness in his tutoring of meek individuals. He discloses more about himself, about his work, and what he is doing, and what taking his yoke upon us will mean. He thus expands the horizon of the person being tutored and usually gives that person work to do. You and I soon find 
that discipleship involves more field work and more lab work than lectures. And for the serious disciple, the greater his knowledge, the greater his meekness. The more he strives to become like Jesus, the more he wishes to declare his gospel, and the more he rejoices exceedingly when Christ's message is heeded, like the outreaching sons of Mosiah, who rejoiced that no human soul could perish if they would but receive the gospel. Unsurprisingly, the Lord's angelic messengers, as did an angel with Alma, are meekly friendly. Blessed art thou, Alma, therefore lift up thy head and rejoice, for thou hast great cause to rejoice, for thou hast been faithful in keeping the commandments of God from the time which thou hast received thy first message from him. And then the angel added, Behold, I am he who delivered it unto you. The meek are such caring realists. And these patterns of gentleness and tenderness are too striking to be accidental. They are even reflected in the voice of the Lord, in its timber, for his voice is pleasant and mild and gentle. It was not a voice of thunder, nor of great tumultuous noise, but a voice of perfect mildness, as if it had been a whisper. Yea, a pleasant voice, as if it were a whisper. It was not harsh, neither was it loud but it did pierce them that did hear it to the center. The stunning episode atop the Mount of Transfiguration doubtless involved the same pattern with Peter, James, and John. And though we do not have all of the sacred particulars, they received special blessings there. But they could not have been atop the Mount of Transfiguration except they were lowly men. And so the pattern continues. It is a pattern of generosity and gentleness on the part of the Father and the Son. Astonishingly, brothers and sisters, to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it becomes abundantly clear that the Father and Son are giving away the secrets of the universe. If only you and I can avoid being offended by their generosity if we would be with them, whether on a mountaintop or forever. We must ponder anew those sobering words, for none is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly in heart. Besides, brothers and sisters, can we ever truly and fully accept ourselves until we become more like them, that you and I may be meek disciples is my prayer on this special day. I salute you as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and thank him for being our yoke master and for being meek and lowly and for inviting us to learn of him. It is the only way we can truly learn of him to take his yoke upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.